Next, I want to talk about how does ventilation occur. So ventilation is done by muscle action. This involves the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. When those muscles contract and relax, uh, it's going to change the, the volume of the thoracic cavity, which in turn affects the pressure. And remember, air moves from high pressure area to a lower pressure area. So think about a vacuum, right? You use vacuum to clean your floor. So how does a vacuum work? Basically, vacuum create, creates a low pressure inside. And that's going to drive air and you know some you know, dirt particles go move into the low pressure, moving into the vacuum, right? So this vacuum creates that suction action by creating low pressure area inside. So that will draw the, the air and uh, along with the particles inside because air moves from high pressure, which is outside the, uh, outside the vacuum into the low pressure which is inside the vacuum. This, so high pressure is outside the vacuum. Okay, same thing for your lungs. Okay, uh, when you inhale, those muscles contract, that's going to increase the volume of thoracic cavity over here. Now I want you to inhale and really kind of experience the expanding of the thoracic cavity. Now, when the volume goes up, the pressure is going to go down because there is inverse relationship between volume and pressure. And again, it's an inverse relationship. So when volume goes up, pressure of you know, the same space is going to go down. So when those muscles expand your thoracic cavity, that's going to decrease the pressure in the thoracic cavity. And now the lungs have lower pressure or lower pressure than the environment, right? Than the external environment. So the air is going to move in from this higher pressure area into the lower pressure area. So air is drawn in, and this is inhalation. Exhalation is the opposite. Exhalation, those muscles will relax, and that's going to kind of shrink your thoracic cavity, right? So the volume goes down. Now the pressure will go up, and that's going to eventually exceed the pressure from the external environment, right? So the air is going to move from the lungs to the external environment, right? So that's exhale, air going out. All right, now the breathing and ventilation is controlled by a part of your brain and specifically the medulla oblongata, which is part of the brain stem. So if you injure the brain stem, if you injure medulla oblongata, that could affect your breathing. So that could be very dangerous. Now, how does medulla oblongata regulate breathing? Through some monitors. So there are some chemical sensors that monitor carbon dioxide concentration and the blood pH. So when the carbon dioxide concentration is too high, blood pH too low, is going to kind of trigger the medulla oblongata to kind of make your body inhale to get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Okay. Now, you need to know a couple of concepts. Uh, they are mentioned in the PEACE study manual. When you inhale and exhale, the amount of air going in and out during each breath under resting conditions, normal conditions, you're not working out, you're not uh, you know, being very excited. So it's a resting condition. That amount of air is called tidal volume. You can see uh, on this uh, diagram, the volume right here, this volume, that's the tidal volume, TV. So you inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. So that volume, the amount of air you inhale and exhale, that's the tidal volume. You will always have a little bit air in the lungs. 
um, you can't get it out. Otherwise, your lungs are going to be completely collapsed, right? There's no air. So you will also, uh, you will always have a little bit of air left in the lungs, no matter how hard you exhale. And that little amount of air is called a residual volume, residual volume. Last is the wrote some sentences with some blanks for you to fill out. If you can get the correct answers, that means you probably have pretty good understanding of how these two systems interact. So these two systems are really connected at the lungs, right? The heart, um, and specifically the pulmonary circuit, is going to send deoxygenated blood, right? Or the well. Use the official term. Don't don't do the bad blood. Deoxygenated blood to the lungs via which blood vessels? The pulmonary arteries. Arteries. Remember, the arteries always take blood away from the heart, right? So this is where the heart is sending the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So the blood is going away from the heart. So the blood goes to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. Now the pulmonary arteries are going to branch off, right, and form smaller and smaller arteries, and eventually capillaries. Capillaries are going to be, you know, surround all those alveoli, which is the site for gas exchange. And at alveoli, through the diffusion, the blood is going to drop off carbon dioxide and picks up uh, oxygen that you just inhale into the alveoli, and then you exhale and right, get rid of the carbon dioxide. Now, after the gas exchange, now you have the good blood, right? The oxygenated blood. The oxygenated blood is going to return to the heart, and specifically the left atrium, through pulmonary veins. Okay. Uh, again, you can see the veins are the blood vessels that bring blood toward the heart, right? Return the blood back to the heart. And sometimes, like pulmonary veins, they do carry oxygenated blood, the good blood. All right, now last, let's talk about factors affecting the respiratory system and some of the respiratory diseases. There are environmental factors, for example, pollutants in the air, smoke, and uh, uh, pollen. Uh, pollen can also cause asthma, not just pollen, but some uh, uh, animal genders, right, can also cause asthma. And uh, we're going to mention asthma a little bit in the immune response, immune system. It's a really kind of hyper sensitivity from your immune system, right, to respond to some harmless particles in the air. Genetic conditions can also lead to respiratory diseases. For example, cystic fibrosis. In cystic fibrosis, uh, which I have a description right here, uh, but basically, the patient, oh, I don't know what happened there. Patients with cystic fibrosis produce mucus is really thick, is abnormally thick. The, let's say this is the mucus, right? Let's say this is the trachea. And you have uh, the, the inner lining, some of the inner lining cells in trachea that can secrete mucus because mucus is a, a kind of defense mechanism. Mucus is sticky. So it's very good at trapping pathogens, dust particles you know, from the air, so that those things do not get down to your lungs and cause lung infection. But for people with cystic fibrosis, the mucus is really thick. It's abnormally thick. Normal people can use cilia. Um, so those are kind of hair-like structures. Uh, in the uh, inner lining cells. So the cells can use the cilia to kind of sweep the, the mucus up to the throat. And then you can get rid of mucus along with whatever is trapped in the mucus, right? This is a, a mechanism for you to get rid of the pathogens and foreign substances uh, out of your respiratory system. But for people with cystic, cystic fibrosis, the mucus is so thick, it's so thick, that the, the movement of the cilia cannot move mucus up. So these patients will have mucus you know, stuck in the respiratory tract. It's warm, it's you know, humid, it's, it's moist, and uh, all the pathogens trapped there, they just love it, right? They can go down the respiratory system, get to the lungs, and cause lung infection.
So usually people with cystic fibrosis often, you know, get lung infect, get frequent lung infections. Now let's look at some practice problems. Number one, which of these terms specifically means the intake and expulsion of air using the lungs? So which term is it? It's ventilation, right? Ventilation. Inspiration, that means inhale, inhalation. Right? Inhalation is the same thing as inhalation. But it's only one part of the question, right? The intake will be inhalation, but the term does not include expo uh, expulsion, which is exhalation. Aeration, that means the uh, lungs taking in air, right? You're providing air. That's what aeration means. Again, it doesn't include the second part. Uh, oxygenation, that means oxygen is added to the air or added to the blood. Um, it, it does not describe the inhalation and exhalation process. So the correct answer is C. Question two, at the end of the sprint, a runner breathed hard because the medulla obligata senses which of the following. We talked about this earlier. The uh, regulation of breathing is regulated by medulla obligata. And medulla obligata relies on the information from sensors. Right? Those sensors sense or monitor carbon dioxide level. That's number one. And blood pH. Oops, blood pH. I want to point out that number one is really the carbon dioxide level, right? It's not oxygen level. Some people tend to think, oh, it's gotta be about the oxygen level, but that's not true. It is about oxygen level, but it's not oxygen level is not monitored. Your body is actually monitoring the carbon dioxide level. Okay, number two, blood pH. So how is the blood pH an indication of you know, little oxygen or too much carbon dioxide. When you do not breathe, you don't have oxygen coming in, right? And you do not get rid of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is going to accumulate in your body. And as carbon dioxide accumulates in the blood, carbon dioxide can react with water and that's going to generate um, carbonic acid. So this is an acid. Why is it acid? Because it can disassociate in water and release hydrogen ions, right? So um, substances, chemicals that can release hydrogen ion when it disassociate in water is an acid. So that's going to decrease your blood pH. Okay, the acid, remember the lower on the pH level from um, 0 to 14. Number 7 is neutral. When you go lower, that's acidic range, right? The smaller the number is, the more acidic a solution is. So this is more acidic, this is less acidic. All right. Now, the acid resulting from carbon dioxide accumulation is going to decrease the pH. And like I said, you have sensors that can sense the uh, decrease in pH. So this means your blood is getting acidic because there's too much carbon dioxide. And that information is going to um, be sent to medulla obligata and the medulla is going to kind of um, signal your brain to, to breathe. All right now, so which one is the correct answer? A, some people may think this is the correct answer, but it's not. Remember I said those chemical sensors do not monitor oxygen level. They only monitor carbon dioxide level. C, number two, low, uh, well, <laughs> this should be high carbon dioxide levels, right? Because you, uh, the, the runner is doing some uh, exercise and this, the body is running out of oxygen. So that kind of, uh, your cells are generating too much um, carbon dioxide. So the um, sensors are telling the medulla to breathe harder, to breathe more frequently. So it's due to the high carbon dioxide level and, and not low. Blood becoming more alkaline, that's not true. It's actually more acidic, right? Because of all the carbon dioxide generated from, from the exercise, from all the cells. So your blood is becoming acidic. 
and that acidity, that blood pH, is going to prompt medulla to tell the brain to breathe harder. Number three, exchange of gases occur in which of the following structures of the respiratory system? Gas exchange, where does it happen primarily? Alveoli, right, the air sacs at the end of the uh, respiratory tract. Number four, what will happen to the tidal volume if your chest is constricted? If your chest is constricted, you can't expand it as much, right? So you can't breathe in as much air as before. So that's going to decrease your tidal volume. All right, now if you are using this particular version of the TEAS study manual, there is a typo. It's on page 110. It mentions about some of the uh, pathogens for the respiratory system, uh, specifically some viruses. Influ influenza, which causes a flu, is not a coronavirus. It's not a coronavirus. It is a type of virus, but it's not coronavirus. Coronaviruses usually cause other respiratory tract diseases. For example, common cold, right? If you get a cold, that's uh, different than a flu, right? So the common cold is caused by coronavirus. Uh, another example is SARS, MERS, those are all caused by coronaviruses, including the, the pandemic we're going through right now, right? COVID-19 is also caused by a novel coronavirus. All right, that's it. Good job, guys. Getting close to the end of anatomy and physiology. So keep up the good work.